play, but I'm just changing cables here. So it's my pleasure to welcome Matthew LaHaye to, to give this course on mechanical quantum systems. Matthew is, has many collaborations with Brazil. So he has collaborations with Amir Caldeira and Frederico Brito in Sao Paulo. So now he's going to talk to us about nanomechanical uh, systems, quantum systems. Great, Thank thanks, uh, Fernando. And, um, you know, I'm really excited to be here this week, and I want to thank the organizers, Fernando, and everybody else for uh, extending the invitation uh, to have me come down here. Um, I'm really honored to be a part of this. So I'm looking forward to th uh, the week interacting with all of you. Um, okay, so as, uh, as Fernando mentioned, I'm uh, from Syracuse University. And, you know, whenever I go to conferences, particularly overseas, um, I get asked a lot of questions about where uh, Syracuse University, or as we call it, SU, is. And so um, what I thought I would do is, is just spend a couple minutes talking about uh, where I'm from. Okay. So Syracuse, or SU, it's actually located um, in New York State, in upstate New York. So it's where this star is right here. And we're about 30 minutes from one of the Great Lakes, uh, Lake Ontario. And we're about a four or five hour drive from, from New York City. So we're pretty much located in what's called the central New York, right in the heart of, of New York State. I, incidentally, I've put on the map here a couple other places that are important uh, for my career and, and in, are related to the research that I'll be talking about throughout these talks. One is uh, College Park, Maryland, where I did my PhD work. Uh, and the other is Pasadena, California, where I did a, a postdoc at, at Caltech be, before coming to Syracuse. Um, returning to Syracuse, though, so the city is actually pretty small. It's a has a population of less than 700,000 people. Um, it's, you know, this 660,000 includes some of the surrounding towns and villages, so it's a really small city. And one of the things that's nice about it, though, is that it's really quick, very quickly, you can get outside the city, and it's, the surrounding areas are very beautiful. There's lots of lakes and parks. There's a series of lakes called the Finger Lakes where there's wineries and all kinds of outdoor activities, and there's mountain ranges nearby. So it's a very, um, very scenic area with lots of opportunities for activities and, and things like that. The university itself is actually in the city. Uh, you can see an aerial view of it here. This is a close-up view of the center of the university. Um, it has a student population of about 21,000, and roughly half of that is undergraduate students, the other half is uh, various graduate students in all different kinds of um, academic uh, programs. Um, the, so the University by American Standards is kind of a medium-sized university, but uh, there's all kinds of programs not just in uh, liberal arts, which is what physics is in, but there's law schools and uh, business administration, management, communication, and so on. Um, I said that the, the surrounding area is very scenic and beautiful, and I think most people who live in the area would agree with that for at least seven months out of the year. The other five months out of the year, from about December through March, it's actually really cold, and we get t tons of snow. We get something like three to four meters of snow a year. And to give you an idea of how t cold the temperatures are, uh, this past February, the temperature never got above zero Celsius, and the average was something like minus 10 or minus 15 degrees Celsius. I, I happen to like the snow, so I love it uh, up until about March when I start to get sick of it. But Okay, so uh, the university is also known for it. its, its basketball. It's a big basketball town. It has a famous basketball program, and it can regularly bring in 30 or 40,000 people for a game into this arena here. The, the uh, Carrier Dome is what it's called. You can actually see the Carrier Dome in this picture up here. And right before the Carrier Dome, you can see this very faintly, this uh, smaller building here. That's actually the physics building. And the physics department at SU, um, it's a medium-sized department in, in comparison with other American universities. There's about 30 faculty, 70 grad students, 20 or 30 research associates, postdocs. Um, despite being sort of a modest size, we actually have a fairly wide range of different research directions that faculty are uh, interested in, and it ranges from the stuff that I work on, uh, which would generically so would say quantum devices, uh, to soft matter and biophysics, gravitational wave detection, high energy, both experiment and theory, and also uh, cosmology. So there's a lot of different directions of research. Anyways, if you're interested in learning more about um, physics at SU, feel free to talk to me about it this week. You can also check out our, our website here. Uh, so I've been at Syracuse for about six years now. And I've put together um, a small research group. And I should have said uh, I'm an experimentalist, so we've put together a, a lab and a small research group. Um, I have a postdoc, Francisco Ruschenal, who uh, did his PhD down here at Unicamp. He's been with me for the last five years, and I believe will be returning 
uh, to take a position at Udicamp later this year. I also have a graduate student, Hugo Hao, who's, who's from China, and uh, at any, any given time, a number of undergraduates will be working in uh, the lab with me. Um, so I said earlier I study generically uh, quantum devices. To do this, we work at uh, ultra-low temperatures, so millikelvin temperatures. So we've put together an infrastructure uh, to do that, and it includes dilution refrigerator, shown here. Uh, we have a helium liquefaction facility. Uh, we can produce liquid helium for our, our, our refrigerator to run. Uh, and we also have various microwave electronics for uh, carefully and very sensitively probing the quantum devices that, that we measure. Um, and so I'll be talking about our experiments uh, primarily in, in lecture three in a couple of days. Um, as Fernando uh, mentioned earlier, an important part of my group's work are, the, are collaborations with theorists, uh, including Fred Britta, uh, Sal Carlos, um, and, and Amir over at, at Unicamp. Okay. So that's just some background about uh, where I come from and uh, what my research group is like. What I want to do now, um, before giving you an outline of the rest of today's talk and before I give you an outline of, of the three talks in general, what I want to do is just give you some context about uh, the field that I work in. And so I'm going to spend a few slides doing that and I'll come back to then giving you an outline of the rest of the talks. So um, the field I work in, I, I call it mechanical quantum systems. Some other people call it that as well. You might also hear it referred to as mechanical systems in the quantum regime. Some people call it uh, quantum optomechanics. I've even been at a concert or, or a conference that called it uh, nano opto electromechanical systems near the quantum limit. That one was kind of a mouthful. But the point is, it's, it's actually a very new field, and we don't even, it's so new we don't even really have a good name for it yet. Uh, there's some disagreement about that. But th despite the fact that it's a new field, it's actually a fairly large field that spans many different topics within physics and engineering. And it brings together researchers from all, all different topics, from gravitational wave detection, superconducting devices, to nanomechanics, quantum computing, optomic physics, uh, quantum optics, and, and so on. And so it's actually a very exciting uh, research field with interactions between many different um, people with different motivations, and different types of systems that they're developing. Um, and, you know, underlying all that diversity, though, there is a common theme uh, among that research. And what we're interested in doing is really studying the, the quantum properties of mechanical systems that are normally um, well described by classical uh, physics. And so this is kind of a, a vague statement, so let me make it more precise. When I say mechanical systems, um, I'm talking about several different possible categories of, of systems. So on the one hand, we have people developing devices that are very familiar to uh, our everyday experience. Structures like beams and cantilevers or uh, wine, wine glass shaped structures like these toroids shown here, except at the, the nano or, or micro scale. There are other um, researchers developing more exotic mechanical systems made out of things like uh, graphene, carbon nanotubes, um, superfluid acoustic cavities, surface acoustic wave cavities, and uh, there's many others. There's also a group that I would lump together as developing or working with you know, regular old macroscopic objects, things that you can see with your naked eye or, or hold in your hand, like these mirrors from gravitational wave uh, collaboration, also known as LIGO. Okay, so this is just a, a small subset of the types of devices that are being developed and, and studied in my field. And I just wanted to give you a, a small flavor of it here. Uh, over the course of the three talks, I'll try to give you a better picture of the full breadth of the types of systems that people are developing in, in this field of mechanical quantum systems. Okay, so when I say these systems are normally well described by classical physics, what I'm talking about are their emotional degrees of freedom, right? So we know structures like this, for instance, they have uh, sets or spectra of, of vibrational modes, right? There's flexural modes, torsion modes, breathing or dilatational modes where the structures are breathing in and out. There's also flapping modes like these shown here. And we know from classical elasticity theory how to calculate these, these mode spectra, okay? And we also know that if we exert a force, we apply, you know, ping one of these structures, we also know that the resulting motion of the structure can be decomposed into these modes, right? So if we take one of these nano beams here and just were to pluck it at its center, it would ring primarily in its fundamental in-plane mode, back and forth in-plane. And 
we would, it would ring with a characteristic frequency, which we can calculate using elasticity theory, and which would just depend upon the geometry and the materials properties of that beam. Moreover, we know that for this motion, the ringing back and forth, we can ascribe to it an effective mass and effective spring constant. And so at the end of the day, the system, at least for small vibrations about its equilibrium point, behaves just like a simple harmonic oscillator, right? Just like a mass on a spring. And I, I have to make the point, it's, it's probably obvious, but make the point that under normal conditions, this behaves like a classical simple harmonic oscillator. Every point on this structure here, the position and momentum of it are well defined and evolve in time as you'd expect from Newton's second law. The energy of this mode as it's oscillating can take on a continuum of values, which just depend upon how hard you hit it, how often you exert the force, the frequency of it, and how strongly coupled this beam is to its surroundings, how damped it is, okay? And clearly, probably the most obvious statement would be that under normal conditions, we never observe superposition or quantum superposition or quantum interference effects with these, these structures. But there's no reason we know of why, under the right conditions, we couldn't use quantum mechanics to model these systems, okay? So for example, this cantilever here, if we wanted to model the displacement of the tip of that cantilever, we could invoke the postulates of quantum mechanics, right? We could require that the position and momentum of the tip of the cantilever be represented by operators that uh, don't commute. We could require that the time evolution of the system be governed by, by Schrodinger's equation. And if we do that, then we'd expect to observe or recover you know, all the features normally one associates with a quantum simple harmonic oscillator, like discrete energy levels, right? The set of usual ladder states of the harmonic oscillator, where omega here, the frequency, represents the vibrational frequency of this, this cantilever as it's oscillating in that fundamental mode. We'd also expect that this oscillator would have zero point fl fluctuations of finite uncertainty packet width, um, or wave function width. And here, the zero point fluctuations would just be, you know, the residual vibrations of this structure that persist as you, even if you cool it down to absolute zero temperature. In addition, we'd expect to see a characteristic that's not unique to quantum harmonic oscillators, but is more ge generic for all quantum systems, superposition states. So under the right conditions, under the right measurement and, and uh, preparation conditions, quantum mechanics would allow for even a cantilever like this to be prepared in a superposition of, say, uh, position states, like shown in this illustration here, okay? So this is, these are the effects, some of the effects that people in my field are trying to observe with these mechanical systems. They're trying to take uh, you know, structures that are very familiar to our everyday experience that are well described by classical physics and prepare and measure them in a way that these quantum effects become manifest, okay? And over the, the next couple lectures, I'll show you examples and hope to convince you that, in fact, people in our field are getting to the point where we're starting to be able to prepare and measure these in a way where you know, non-classical properties of these systems start, start to become uh, measurable. I'll, I'll show you, for instance, that one group has shown evidence for the discrete nature of the energy spectrum of a micromechanical oscillator. Another group has uh, seen uh, physics related to zero-point fluctuations of a nano structure. What hasn't been done yet, but what is really one of the holy grails of the field, is prepare some kind of macroscopic superposition state of one of these systems. It hasn't been done yet, but if we could do that, then it opens up the possibility to perform um, you know, experiments that could really push or probe quantum mechanics in new macroscopic limits, essentially the limits of engineered moving parts. Okay, so perhaps that could enable us to perform new tests of decoherence in these limits. Again, we'd be performing tests of decoherence with systems that are moving in orders of magnitude larger uh, than systems with which decoherence has been tested before. Um, maybe it could enable us to perform sort of Schrodinger cat-like experiments, except for with objects that are you know, more like a cat than, than maybe could ever have been imagined. Um, it also would enable us uh, to test further our understandings of, of measurement. You know, what, do, what does quantum mechanics say about our ability to resolve the motion of a macroscopic body? What limits does quantum mechanics place in our ability to resolve the motion of a macroscopic body? Could we prepare some kind of object in a, in a squeeze state where we have arbitrarily precise precision in the measurement of the motion of, of, of some uh, uh, mechanical system? Okay? So a lot of the motivation for the field uh, are these fundamental pursuits. 
But in going after these sort of fundamental questions, people were also developing really exquisite um, sensing technology, particularly with regard to sensing mo uh, motion and, and forces. And so there's a lot of effort in the field to develop these mechanical systems uh, for new applications. For example, in uh, quantum information processing, there's proposals and actually a lot of experimental work just in the last couple of years um, in developing uh, op what's called an optomechanical transducer. And the idea is, is that this, these nano or micro-mechanical elements serve to shuttle coherently uh, quantum information from the microwave regime into the optical regime. So two disparate energy scales, and these mechanical devices would serve as some kind of coherent link to shuttle state information between the two. There's also applications in, in, uh, in biophysics and imaging, quantum sensing. You know, if you're interested in the ultimate sensitivity of a particular probe imaging technique, it's likely that in the end you're going to be limited by the quantum properties of the probe, the zero point fluctuations of your, of your probe. Um, gravitational wave detection, I'll get into this in a little bit. There's, there's uh, connections with, with the pushing the ultimate sensitivity of gravitational wave detectors. And finally, there's, there's prospects for studying, really with unprecedented um, sensitivity, how energy is transported and converted between electrical and mechanical domains, how it's dissipated in nanoscale and microscale materials. Okay? So there's a lot of perspective, um, fundam fundamental pursuits, and applications that people in the field are interested in. And I say perspective because we haven't actually gotten there yet. We're developing, we're trying to work toward all these different possibilities here. But the field in the last you know, 10 years has made remarkable progress uh, towards developing this, and I'll try to share that with you over the next three lectures. Okay? Um, just to, I want to give you just a few reviews uh, if you're interested before I move on. Um, so there's, there's a number of recent reviews that do a good job of charting sort of the development of the field in the last 10 years. Um, there's a couple sort of uh, broader reviews from Physics Today one was from 2005, um, written by Keith Schwab and Michael Rukas. This paper is out of date uh, in regard to results that have happened. You know, this is 10 years ago and a lot's happened in that time. But they do uh, a nice job of, of um, talking about the motivations and origins of the, the field and also laying out a lot of the experimental challenges that we face. Uh, and I should say, so Keith Schwab and Michael Rukas are two of the founders of the field of mechanical quantum systems. And also, Keith is my, my PhD advisor, or was my PhD advisor, and, and Michael was my uh, postdoc advisor. Um, more recently, another Physics Today article uh, from 2012. This is much more up to date in terms of the results it talks about, but still there are some results that have happened in the last couple of years that are, are not included in, in this article here. Um, but it's still a very good, very good review. Uh, and there's also a handful of more technical reviews that I've listed here in recent years. And I want to highlight this last one here from the Proceedings in the National Academy of Sciences from this year. Uh, in it, they focus on the implementation of mechanical devices in hybrid quantum systems, specifically for use in, in quantum information uh, applications. So you, again, using mechanical elements for quantum tra state transducers or uh, for serving as uh, memory elements or, or buses. Okay, and they really talk about sort of the state of the art of of those uh, applications for mechanics. Okay, so let me give um, an outline uh, for the, the rest of today's talk and the rest of the, the, the lectures I'll give this week. Um, so with, today I wanna um, just like step back and give a broad picture of the field in terms of the origins and, and motivations of the work, okay? And what I really would hope to show you is how the field today has been shaped by a number of different research directions that have sort of merged together. Everything from uh, gravitational wave detection to nanomechanics feeding into the present state of the field. In tomorrow, uh, Friday's lecture, I'll start talking about some basic conditions um, that you need to take into account in order to try and observe quantum behavior in these, these otherwise classically behaving systems. So I'm really going to look at experimental challenges that we face in trying to see uh, quantum behavior in, in, in these macroscopic bodies. And I'll give you, I'll tell you about what the state of the art is in terms of meeting these conditions. And uh, here you'll really see specific examples of, of work that's been done recently of people starting to see um, non-classical behavior in these systems. In the third lecture, uh, what I'll do is I'll talk about uh, a system that people believe has a lot of potential for serving as a test bed for studying uh, the quantum properties of motion, namely that uh, superconducting qubits coupled to mechanics. And um, 
I, this is a system that I've been working with for the last 10 years. I'll talk about how it's analogous to certain systems in Cavity QED, and also tell you what the state of the art is in terms of developing this system. Um, and I'll have some uh, final words in about the, what the future prospects are for working with it. Okay, so a couple things I want to say ab about the lectures. Um, I, I'm going to come at the lectures from an experimental perspective and really talk about both experimental challenges and, and sort of experimental developments uh, that have gone on over the last 10, 15 years in the field. And also, I'm not going to get too deep into any one particular subject. My, my intent is to really give you sort of a broad picture, a survey of the field, and then provide you with references for you to, to learn more about it if, if you're interested, okay? All right, so let's get started. Um, as, I, as I said, the, today's lecture will be about uh, the origins and motivations of the field. And so I, I've said a couple times now that it's a very diverse uh, research field, and really that diversity stems, at least as I see it, from four main uh, areas of, of research over the last several decades. And these include uh, mesoscopic and superconducting devices, nanomechanical systems, uh, a, a group that I've sort of lumped together a bunch of different fields, like quantum optics, cavity QED, atomic physics more generally, and gravitational wave detection. And so what I'd like to do today is sort of go through and look at how the present state of the field has been shaped by these different research directions. Okay. And what I'll do today, what I'm going to do right now is we'll start with really the oldest root to the field, which would be gravitational waves. Okay, so I think everybody here uh, knows what a gravitational or knows what gravitational waves are or are suspected to be. Right? They're predictions from from general relativity of they're supposed to be space-time ripples that propagate through the universe, the speed of light. They're supposed to be generated by accelerated massive objects, like these two inspiring black holes in this ar artistic rendition here. So these two black holes are spiraling around each other. They're dragging space-time around, and they're creating these waves. Oops. They're creating these waves, then, that radiate outward through space. Okay? Now, if you wanted to, so far, such gravitational waves have not been directly detected, but... If, they, if you wanted to detect them, the way you would do it would be to go to some region in space where you would suspect these waves to be propagating through, and you would measure the relative separation between two objects over time. And by doing that, you should be able to track these gravitational waves as they come through. So to give you an example, imagine, again, you have, somewhere out here in space, you have your, your experimental apparatus here, which consists of these two objects that before the wave passes through, they're separated by some distance r, and then while the wave's going through, that distance is either stretched by some amount delta r or compressed by some amount delta r as the wave goes through, okay? So these waves are, are changing the relative spacing. You have two points in space. They're producing a strain on space, basically, right? The thing is, and this is the connection to the field of mechanical quantum systems, this delta r is incredibly small, even for astrophysical events like this. There's this really nice paper from a summer a school from back in the late 1990s by Peter Salson, where he estimates, he does a back-of-the-envelope calculation of what you would expect the strain or the chain, relative change in position between two objects to be on Earth due to a gravitational wave from an inspiraling of black holes 200 megaparsecs away. And that strain that he calculates, you would expect on Earth to observe a, a relative change in the separation of something like 10 to the minus 21. Now, if your, your experimental apparatus, if this R here was one meter, the corresponding change in distance would be 10 to the minus 21 meters, okay? So you're really, really very small changes in the relative spacing of these objects. And just for the fun of it, he went through and, and calculated what the, the strain would be for a, a laboratory uh, gravitational wave source, like a dumbbell rotating around at a fixed frequency, and it's even it's orders and orders of magnitude smaller than this. Okay, okay. So 10 to the minus 21 meters for some experimental apparatus where the, your test masses are separated by it by a meter. It's an incredibly small distance. So you sh should be asking yourselves, how exactly can one detect such small strains, such small relative separations, change in the relative separations? And there's really two uh, techniques that people have have developed uh, in the last several decades. And let me just briefly talk about how those work. So the first one, the oldest one, it's called the resonant mass 
detection uh, scheme. And the way this works is you have an aluminum bar. It's usually aluminum, some, some high-purity alloy, high-quality alloy aluminum. And it's massive, several tons. It's usually a, a few meters long. And these beams, which are typically also cylindrical, they have vibrational modes, just like the structures I was talking about before. And these modes are actually expected to couple with gravitational waves that pass through them. Okay? So you can imagine as this gravitational wave passes through this bar here, it's contracting and expanding space as it passes through. And so it actually contracts and expands the length of this, this beam, this bar. And what's been shown is that this, you know, the, the waves passing through should most strongly ring up the longitudinal, the fundamental longitudinal mode of this, this beam here that's about one kilohertz, okay? And so once, you know, these waves pass through, it starts resonantly uh, kicking around this bar and ringing up this fundamental mode. That mechanical motion then is transduced into the electronic domain where it's read out by sensitive electronics, okay? So you have gravitational wave comes in, rings up the mechanical mode, which is then converted into electrical domain for, for measurement. Now, this, this type of, of detector, it's also known as a, a Weber detector, after the, the guy who first invented this back in the early 1960s. And when he did this, um, his initial sensitivity that he had achieved in detecting basically change in the length of his, his Weber bar, his resonant mass bar, sensitivity was on the order of 10 to the minus 16 for strain. Okay, so his bar, it's a couple meters long, so it means he has a sensitivity of in detecting the length of the beam of about 2 times 10 to the minus 16 meters. So that's sub-femtometer sensitivity in monitoring the length, the, the length of this macroscopic object. And that sounds really small, right? That's less than the, the width of a, a, a nucleus. But again, we need, as I said in the present, previous slides, in order to detect gravitational waves from astrophysical events, you need something like 10 to the minus 21 strain sensitivity. And actually, if you fast forward 50 years, uh, the field has advanced remarkably. And the state-of-the-art detectors now, which are actually cooled down to hundreds of millikelvin on cryogenic fridges, and they use really sensitive superconducting and quantum interference devices for the transduction of the mechanical fluctuations into the electrical domain. And they can actually, they're getting to the point where they have strain sensitivities of about 10 to the minus 21, okay, for, again, measuring basically the relative length changes of this, of this beam. Okay, so again, if this is a couple meters long, their sensitivity, their strain sensitivity corresponds to a displacement sensitivity of like 10 to the minus 21 meters, which is incredible. All right, so uh, I should just point out, so far, so then they're, they're approaching a limit where they should detect gravitational waves. They haven't seen any yet. There's some limitations to this particular type of detection scheme, mainly that you're limited to frequencies, uh, your you know, signal frequencies around the resonant frequencies of your beam, which is, occurs at a kilohertz. So yeah, they have a narrow uh, bandwidth in which they can have uh, C signals. And it turns out there's a limited number of gravitational wave sources that uh, are in that bandwidth around a kilohertz. But there's also interesting other physics that you can do with these systems, and you can read about it there. I just want to point out uh, the, uh, the second technique for detecting gravitational wave detectors, and the one that's sort of the mo receiving the most uh, use today are based upon these Michelson interferometers. So the idea is you have two arms in this interferometer. Each arm has a cavity, optical cavity in it. And the idea is, as the gravitational waves pass through this interferometer, one arm becomes expanded and the other arm would be contracted. So there's a, a change in the path length of the two arms, as, of each arm, as the gravitational wave passes through, okay? So this would change, this, the change in length of these two arms would give rise to a phase difference in the light as it returns to the beam splitter here. And so from measuring the changes in phase difference, you can infer, in principle, gravitational waves passing through your interferometer, right? And it's important to point out that the phase that the light develops as it goes along each of these arms here is gonna be proportional to the length of the arm, right? So the longer the arm is, the larger the phase difference will be for a small change in the length of the two arms, right? And so that strain sensitivity, your ability to resolve these changes in the lengths of your interferometer arms is gonna be improved with length. And so that's motivated people to spend tons of money to develop these really large interferometers, which are kil kilometer scale, kilometers in scale. All right, there's two of them here in, in the US. I know there's at least one in Europe, 
one in Australia, and there might be several other ones. These, this one's here in Hanford, Washington. This one's in Livingston, Louisiana. These two are, were built by the LIGO collaboration. LIGO is a laser interferometer gravitational wave observatory. And it's, it's funded by uh, the National Science Foundation. But these, uh, you can see here, I mean, if these, these arms, they've made them kilometers long in order to really improve the strain sensitivity, make them see as precisely as possible changes in the length of these, these interferometer arms. And you can imagine them being so long and so sensitive, they're also going to be sensitive to many other noise, tech, noise sources. And so if you actually look at their strain sensitivity, their ability to detect the changes in length of these arms, you can see that there are all these other sources of noise in here, everything from seismic noise to transducer noise, thermal noise, et cetera. But if you look here, the green and the red curves, they correspond to these two interferometers. You can see that the, if you look at the strain, the value of the, the strain spectral density here drops down below 10 to the minus 22. And so actually, if you integrate all this noise from 100 hertz up to about a kilohertz, they find a strain sensitivity of about 10 to the minus 21. And it's over this, this large band of about 100 hertz to a kilohertz. So it's a very use, and it turns out to be that's a very useful frequency band for detecting gravitational waves. The point I want to really emphasize, though, again, is they have a strain sensitivity of 10 to the minus 21. These arms are kilometers long. So that position sensitivity, their ability to resolve the length changes of, of the, the interferometer arms, is something like an atometer. So a thousandth of the width of an uh, atomic nucleus. All right? So both of these techniques I talked about, the resonant mass detector and the LIGO interferometer, have these incredible displacement sensitivities, detecting displacements that are much, much smaller than you know, atomic nuclei or atoms or things on the macroscopic scale. And so this should raise some important questions. And this is really getting into the connection with our field of mechanical quantum systems. So is it sensible to talk about measuring displacements of macroscopic bodies with that kind of sensitivity? If so, or even if not, does quantum mechanics come into play at all, right? We're talking about really, really small displacements that we're measuring, small compared to fundamental particles or to, to the nucleus, nuclei and atoms. So does quantum mechanics come into play at all when you start talking about resolving motion at that, that scale? And if so, does quantum mechanics place limits on how well you can actually resolve the motion? And the answer to these questions is yes, okay? It is sensible to talk about measuring displacements that small of macroscopic bodies. Quantum mechanics does come into play through zero-point fluctuations, also through the noise properties of the measurement probe itself, primarily through, through back action of the probe onto the object being measured. And what limits quantum mechanics places on the ultrasensitivity of these, these measurements, it actually depends upon the particular type of measurement that, that you're doing. And so I just wanted to raise these questions here to, to connect it to our field. I will be discussing these, these subjects in more detail in lecture two, what the limits quantum mechanics of, what limits quantum mechanics imposes on, on these kind of measurements and how quantum mechanics comes into play uh, in the first place. It's important to note these questions, when researchers were first starting to develop gravitational wave detection or detectors back in the 1960s and 70s, um, a lot of the, the researchers in the field started asking those, those same questions. And over the following decades, a, a lot of work was done. And some of the leading uh, pioneers in thinking about how quantum mechanics comes into play in the measurement of macroscopic bodies are shown here. And there's some uh, familiar faces probably to people. Like Kip Thorne was one of the original pioneers in thinking about this. Carl Caves, uh, Ron Drever was another one. This guy here, Vladimir Braginsky, he actually literally wrote the book on on quantum measurement. He really thought about these issues for a number of decades and has published this pretty, pretty prominent book uh, in the 1990s, um, which really gets into tackling these questions of, what, you know, if I'm measuring the motion of some macroscopic object, at what point do I have to take into account quantum mechanical effects? And then what role does quantum mechanics play in limiting my ability to, to make measurements of, of that motion? Okay. So I'll, you'll be hearing much more. I'll be talking more about his, some of his ideas in, in the next lecture as well. OK, so one of the things I, I also want to point out, I'm going to transition now to, to a different topic from gravitational wave uh, detection. We're going to look at another influence on 
mechanical quantum systems. But it's interesting to point out that the, all of these guys, in some way or another, during the 1980s and 1990s, were associated with Caltech, either as being professors there or at, as uh, research fellows there. And around that same time, in the early 1990s, um, another professor at Caltech, Michael Rukas, also began thinking about these same questions about how quantum mechanics comes into play in, in mechanical devices, but he was looking at it in a completely different context. He was looking at it in the context of nano-electromechanical systems, okay? And so Michael, again, he began in, at Caltech in the 90s, and really one of sort of his driving research uh, focus over the years has been to look at or try to understand the different electromechanical properties of nanoscale systems, okay? And in particular, he's, inter he's been interested in understanding how those different properties ultimately limit or affect nanoscale technology, or what kind of applications you can develop with these nanoscale systems. And this includes, he was very interested in, what are the limitations that quantum mechanics puts on these nanoscale systems? Can they be utilized uh, for new or novel sensing applications, okay? So I'm gonna come back particularly to Michael's thoughts, that the work he thought about back in the 1990s of the limitations placed by quantum mechanics on, on nanomechanical systems. I'll talk about that in a few minutes. What I wanna do first though is just give you some background about NEMS, nanoelectromechanical systems. I'll talk just a little bit about their basic properties and then get into some of their, the applications that they're being developed for. And I also, I should have said this earlier, I, I tend to talk fast, so if, there's, if you have questions, feel free to interrupt me and, uh, you know. Okay. So nanoelectromechanical systems. There's really two main components of NEMS. There's first, primarily, there's the nanomechanical structure itself, okay? So these structures, I've shown one here, these structures have dimensions that can range from nanometers up to microns. We can fabricate them using standard nanofabrication, microfabrication techniques like electron beam lithography and plasma etching. The types of materials that these systems are made out of uh, span a, a large range, everything from silicon-based compounds to diamond and all kinds of different metals. There are other nanotype uh, structures that are developed sort of bottom-up from growing carbon nanotubes, graphene and nanowires. But for all of these, as I alluded to in an earlier slide, for small displacement or small deformation of these structures, those small displacements obey Hooke's laws, okay? So these are really, as I said before, can be re represented as, as sort of masses on a spring. They're classic, you know, simple harmonic oscillators. And so you can always write down an equation for their motion that looks something like this, just Newton's second law. And in this equation here, the x is, they can represent, typically they'll represent like the displacement of like the center of mass of this structure, or that X might represent some average displacement over the length of the beam. But the point is, is you can always, you know, reduce this flexural motion, the equations of elasticity to this simple Newton's second law form there, okay? I said earlier also in the, one of the first slides that the, these structures have characteristic eigenfrequencies and that you can calculate them from elasticity theory. So I just wanted to give you a concrete example of that here. This would be the, I, the set of eigenmodes for an in, the in-plane resonances of a beam like this. You have, and as I, I mentioned before, these frequencies just depend upon geometry and material, basically. So in this uh, expression here for the frequency of the modes, you have material properties like the Young's modulus, the stiffness, you have T, the tension that's in the film of the, the structure. You have the density, it depends on that. And then you have geometric parameters like width and the length of the beam and the thickness, okay? So we have concrete uh, you know, ex engineering expressions for which we can engineer the, the frequencies of, of these devices. I should also say that the range of frequencies that we can typically engineer for nanoelectromechanical systems is anywhere from tens of kilohertz up to gigahertz. Okay, and that's what primary, uh, primarily what you'll see in the field. There's also, uh, you know, in this equation, uh, describing the motion of these beams, you can include uh, sources of dissipation, and there are many different types of, of dissipation that you can imagine. I won't get into that now. Okay, so again, I just wanted to give you, tell you one of, one of the primary or most important components of a nanoelectromechanical system is the mechanical structure itself, and these are some of the basic properties of it and how people uh, work with it for different applications. The other 
half, the other important component of nanoelectromechanical systems are or is the electronic circuitry that these mechanical structures are embedded in, okay? So this is the electro part of the electromechanical system. And so the, typically these nano devices in, for NEMS are embedded in, so, in some sort of electronic or magnetic circuitry for actuation and transduction of the mechanical motion. And so I've just given you a couple examples here. Uh, there's a whole, whole bunch of other ones written down here, and I'm sure there's more that I'm forgetting. But to give you some idea, just looking at this top device here, we have our nano structure, which is this high aspect ratio beam here. And then for transduction and actuation, we have two, resi oops, we have two resistors at the ends of these beams. And this resistor here, as it's labeled, it's for thermal actuation. And so what actually happens, you pass current through this resistor here, it heats up the beam, and so the beam starts to undergo Brownian motion. You're basically joule heating it up to higher temperature, and so it has more thermal uh, vibrational amplitude. At the other end of the beam, you have another resistor, and this serves as a, a detector. Basically, when this beam starts moving, starts flexing, it changes the geometry there's a strain here, so it changes the geometry, which changes the resistance of these resistors, and you can measure that. You can monitor the modulation and resistance to monitor the modulation or the motion of the mechanical device. Okay? And there's other examples. Uh, let me just, I'll talk about this one as well. This is a, a mechanical device integrated with a superconducting quantum interference device. I'm not going to say how that works, but just in general how this detection scheme works is when this mechanical device moves, when it flexes out a plane, the voltage across this loop changes, and so then you can track the changes in voltage as a function of time to so watch the position of, to measure the position of the mechanics. Okay, and as I said, there's many other techniques. I'll discuss some of these, particularly the single electron transistor detector later on. Okay, but this was the other half of, of NEMS, the other half of nanoelectromechanical systems. It's the integrated electronic circuitry that's used for actuation and detection. Okay, let's talk about a couple applications of these guys. So. One of the defining characteristics of, of nanomechanical systems is their really incredibly small mass, okay? So for an example, a structure like this, it has mass, it's on the order of 100 femtograms, so about 10 to the minus 16 kilograms. And what's important about that is it, it, it enables nanomechanical devices to be used for several really important applications, including mass sensing. And so the way this works, you can, it's a pretty simple exercise to take the expression for the frequency of a mass on a spring, a simple harmonic oscillator, and calculate how that frequency changes as you add or take away small amounts of mass. And if you do that, what you find is that the frequency of the oscillator, simple harmonic oscillator, changes linearly with the added or subtracted mass, delta m. Okay? So as you, say, add mass to this little oscillator here, its frequency is going to decrease proportionally. And it's important to point out, though, that for a given amount of added mass to the structure, the frequency shift of the mode increases if you make that structure have a smaller and smaller mass. So if you reduce the dimensions of this and reduce its, its mass, the frequency shift will increase for um, a given amount of added mass to it. And this, in principle, for nanomechanical devices, this could enable detecting amounts, changes in mass equal to basically a single hydrogen atom, a Dalton change of mass on the, the mechanical structure. Okay, so if you had, uh, in principle, with the right engineered, optimally engineered uh, electronic circuitry, you could detect changes in the frequency of a structure like this uh, that would correspond to individual hydrogen atoms landing on the surface or, or leaving the surface. Okay, the field hasn't gotten to that point yet of having that sensitive detection. But they're getting close, and there's actually a really nice uh, example of it is shown here. And so this, this is from the Rukas group at Caltech. And they used a scheme like this to actually sense individual biomolecules. So in the plot on the upper right hand side here, it's a frequency shift of the mechanical mode versus time. So they're just monitoring the displacement of the mechanical mode, calculating its frequency, and then watching how that changes over time. And over time, what they're actually doing is they have a little nozzle here where they can spray in a solution of biological analytes and they have a shutter so they can you know, stop and, and open that uh, flow when they like. And what they actually see is every time they open the shutter and allow the solution to land, or the biological molecules to land on the surface there, they see these steps corresponding to 
when individual molecules actually land on the surface of the mechanical device. Okay, and they can actually distinguish between different types of molecules, like the beta amylase here and then BSA uh, there. Okay, so this has potential applications, and this a lot of money is actually being invested in this. Uh, you could imagine that this could serve for early warning detection of airborne. Uh, hazardous chemicals, right? You could functionalize one of these nanomechanical devices to bind only to a specific molecule that you're, you're worried about. And then you could make some kind of detector that you put in a room somewhere, and as the air goes through this detector, that particular hazardous uh, molecule is present and lands on this device, it'll bind to it and shift its frequency and give you a warning. There's also applications for developing breathalyzers that would be functionalized in a similar way, except that the detect metabolic compounds that might signal at early stages of some kind of disease, okay? So there's really, really important applications for, you know, developing sort of ultra-sensitive displacement technology to detect the frequency of these devices as best you can. And, you know, sort of what the state of the art is right now, people have pushed this uh, to using carbon nanotubes for the mechanical elements. And so here you have an example of a carbon nanotube cantilever. This has a mass of about an atogram. Which is incredibly small, has a frequency, fundamental frequency of 330 megahertz. They do similar kind of measurements as a frequency as a function of time, and they can see these jumps in the frequency corresponding to small groups of atoms that have been evaporated onto the surface. So really here they're getting to the limit of small groups of, of atomic elements uh, interacting with, with these mechanical probes. Okay, so again, the, what, the, one of the points I want to make, though, is the ultimate limit of this mass sensing would be the point at which these mechanical elements can detect individual, individual hydrogen atoms or, or small groups of hydrogen atoms. Okay. Another um, important application of mechanical devices where a developing um, you know, ultra-sensitive sensing technology is important is something called magnetic resonance force microscopy. And so... The, in or MRFM, and in this, this technique, um, what, what researchers are doing is using cantilevers and, that are at nanoscale and microscale to basically image both biological and inor inorganic samples. And the way this works is you have your cantilever and you glue onto the tip of it or fabricate on the tip of it some kind of magnetic nanoparticle. Then you bring your cantilever in close to the sample that you want to image and what happens then is, is that the magnetic field from this nanoparticle, it sets up a slice throughout the material where the spins inside the material will have alarmer frequency, precession frequency, that's resonant with some applied microwaves. Okay? So the magnetic field from this tip causes spins only within a narrow slice to process at the frequency of this microwave coil. That then, the spins in that resonant slice will start flipping. Right? They start undergoing the, the Rabi oscillations. And what happens then is those spins exert a force back on the cantilever and shift the, the cantilever's frequency. And that frequency actually depends upon whether the spin is up or the spin is down. So the spins oscillating between up and down give you an oscillating frequency of, of the cantilever here. And again, you have to, in order to detect these changes in frequency of the cantilever, you have to do really sensitive uh, monitoring of the motion of the, the probe. This technique has actually been used now um, yeah, for imaging a, with sensitivity of, to single electron spins in materials that can also detect small groups of nuclear spins and do imaging uh, with nanome nanometer resolution of, of biological materials. So they're really doing MRI, uh, except for with sensitivity that's millions of times better than in conventional MRI. So they can actually get down the resolved nanometer scale. The ultimate in this kind of technology would, and what the, the hope was, was you could push this technology to actually do magnetic imaging with sensitivity to single nuclear, nuclear spins. But they, still ha they haven't gotten there yet, but again, getting there will require pushing the de detection limits and our, our ability to resolve mechanical motion. Okay, so coming back to, um, so that, that I wanted to give you there some background on them and their applications. And coming back to the connection to mechanical quantum systems, so in the 1990s, uh, Michael Rukas, again at Caltech, realized that to reach a lot of these ultimate limits in sensing applications, you'd really need to push the mechanical devices uh, to the limit where they're behaving quantum mechanically. Okay? And he, under, he also saw at the time, though, that the characteristics of these nanomechanical devices were such that you should be able to do this. You should be able to push 
it's real, real, realistic to think that you could be able to push these mechanical probes to uh, behave in a quantum mechanical way. And so he envisioned developing NEMs, nanoelectromechanical systems, into quantum electromechanical systems, or QEMS. And his thoughts on this were really just from some basic considerations of some of the, the most basic properties of these nanomechanical devices, namely their small mass, high frequency, and, and low dissipation. And so, the, what, why, are, why are these important? The small mass is important for these systems because they give rise to relatively large, or should give rise to relatively large zero-point motion. Okay? So the standard expression of a zero-point motion of a harmonic oscillator. A device like this cantilever here, if you plug in the dimensions and calculate its mass, you calculate its frequency, you can calculate that the zero-point motion amplitude should be something like 40 femtometers. And this sounds like a really small displacement, but we actually have displacement detection techniques that can resolve displacements better than this. Okay? So this is a physically observable zero-point motion for a macroscopic structure, or what could arguably be considered a macroscopic structure. The high frequency, why is high frequency important? This obviously will set the, oops, this will set the energy spacing of the latter states of the harmonic oscillator, right? The larger omega is, the larger the spacing between these energy levels. And this is important because then that makes you less susceptible to, to thermal fluctuations. So for an example, a one gigahertz device like this one engineered here, you could cool it down to millikelvin temperatures and thermal fluctuations would start to become negligible with respect to that energy splitting there, okay? And also, the low dissipation. It's another important characteristic for these systems, which can range, the quality factors can range from 10 to the three up to 10 to the five down at millikelvin temperatures. And this would imply then that any sort of quantum states that you prepare with these cantilevers or mechanical structures in, they should have long coherence, long relaxation times. And by long, I mean measurably long, something on the order of microseconds. You can actually cal this, calculate this is what you expect for these systems, okay? So these three properties, small mass, high frequency, low dissipation, make nanoelectromechanical systems sort of ideal candidates for de developing these quantum electro electromechanical devices. Okay. So in the, the mid-1990s, mid when, when uh, Rukas was thinking about this stuff, he was joined in his group by, by two uh, postdocs shown here. So Andrew Cleland, who's now at the University of Chicago, and Keith Schwab, who's, who's also a, now a physicist, uh, professor at Caltech. Um, Michael was joined by these two postdocs, and they both uh, pursued their own independent experiments that were each important for the development of quantum electromechanical systems. And so uh, the experiment that the Andrew worked on, uh, it's shown here, his work was published in Nature in 1998, and what he, what he demonstrated in his, his work was it was able to show that the, the frequency of a tor this torsional oscillator here, so he had some nanomechanical structure that oscillates at a, a characteristic frequency, he was able to show that that frequency depended in a very sensitive way on the charge on a nearby electrode. And it was so sensitive, the dependence of frequency on charge was so sensitive that in changes of charge of one electron on this, this electrode here could measurably affect the, the frequency of that, that torsional oscillator. Okay. In Keith's experiment, shown over here, he demonstrated that the th heat transport, the thermal transport through these little suspended nano bridges here at low temperatures, at millikelvin temperatures, was limited, maximally limited, by the thermal conductance quantum. The thermal conductance quantum is basically a reflection of the fact that of the reflection of the finite heat carrying capacity of the acoustic phonons in, the, in these uh, little waveguides, phonon waveguides there, okay? So these two experiments were important sort of for the foundations of quantum electromechanical systems because for one, in the experiment on the left, the Andrews experiment, it demonstrated that you could strongly couple this macroscopic probe with the charge of a fundamental particle in a circuit, okay? And in Keith's work, he demonstrated that you could take really sensitive electronic circuitry, integrate it with a mechanical element, and then use it to probe some quantum mechanical feature of the structure, okay? So these were two important experiments for um, establishing sort of the foundations of quantum electromechanical systems. It's back in the late 1990s. And I just want to note that after the, these works, both uh, Andrew and Keith went on to start their own groups and start developing their own uh, experiments to, 
to further de the development of quantum electromechanical systems. Okay, let me recap. I've said a lot of different things here, so let me try to bring it all together. Um, let me recap what I've said about nanoelectromechanical systems so far. So in the 1990s, nanoelectromechanical systems started to be developed uh, for many important applications, the ultimate limits of which would be set by pushing the mechanical devices uh, to the quantum regime to the ultimate limits of, of sensing. At the same time, it was realized that these nanomechanical devices have ideal characteristics for uh, being pushed into the quantum regime. And around the same period, uh, two preliminary experiments hinted at the future explorations with, with, these, with these devices. Um, what was missing at this time, though, was a set of tools to really perform quantum measurement and control of, of these mechanical structures. We didn't, those, those kind of tools to, you know, resolve uh, the motion, the quantum mechanical motion or quantum mechanical properties of these mechanical structures did not exist at that time. But what people realized was that a possible set of tools could be found in recent developments in uh, mesoscopic and superconducting quantum devices. Okay, so I'm going to switch now to really start talking about the influence of superconducting devices and, and mesoscopic systems on uh, the field of mechanical quantum systems. So, um, again, in the late 1990s, the first sort of quantum device uh, that f people in the field of mechanics realized could be useful for quantum measurement of mechanics was something called the radio frequency single electron transistor. And this was developed by uh, this guy here, Rob Sholkoff, who's at Yale. And Rob is actually currently is one of the leaders in the superconducting quantum computing effort uh, trying to develop uh, quantum processors based upon superconducting computers. And actually, at the time that he developed this radio frequency single electron tra transistor, or RF set, he was actually developing it in the context of quantum computing. He was trying to think of a way to develop an electrometer that could perform ultra-fast and ultra-sensitive measurements of the state of a charged qubit. Okay? And so the, the device that he was working with, it's known as, again, the single electron transistor, or SET, and it's the main components of it are shown here. There's a number of metal electrodes. Uh, one serves as a source, a drain. Another one serves as the island here. There's a gate electrode as well. And the de sort of defining uh, characteristics, uh, let me point out that between these, these this, like the source and the island here, and the drain in the island, there are these tunnel barriers, these very thin insulating barriers. The way this SET works, that the current flowing through here is actually composed of individual electrons tunneling across these barriers, the junctions, in a very correlated fashion. Okay, and the, the, the fact that they're correlated, the tunneling events are correlated, actually reduces the, the, the noise in the current. So it enables you to perform, so you can you know, resolve the current. Uh, you have much less noise in the current than you would with, with other kinds of um, junction-based devices due to these correlations of the electrons hopping across. Another important characteristic of this, this transistor, though, is that the current, the conducting current through here, it's a very sensitive function of the charge on this gate electrode here. So by tuning the charge on this electrode by a fraction of an electron, so the polarization charge, you can actually modulate the current through here substantially. You can turn it from on to off, basically, as far as you're concerned. Okay, so you have a very sensitive electrometer. The current is very sensitive to the charge in the gate electrode there. And what Rob showed he implemented a version of this transistor using RF circuitry that allowed for measurements of charge, or allowed for electrometry, electrometer operating at a bandwidth of 100 megahertz. So in principle, 100 megahertz, you could resolve fluctuations in charge on the scale of you know, 10 nanoseconds here on the gate. Okay, so when this was developed in the late 1990s, it was quickly realized that this could be utilized as a detector of nanomechanical motion. And so that idea was actually put forth uh, by Miles Blanco, who's at Dartmouth. He's one of the leading theorists in the field of mechanical quantum systems. And Miles's idea was that you could take your single electron transistor, which is shown here. You have your two tunnel junctions. You have some circuitry for biasing it and running current through it. And then instead of having that static gate electrode that I mentioned before, you could replace that electrode with a moving cantilever, a metallized cantilever. And then you establish a voltage between that, that moving structure and this little island on the, on the transistor. And so the idea is then, is that when this cantilever moves, when it modulates, 
the, the charge on this little capacitor here, that will modulate the conductance of this transistor, modulate the current, and you could read that out with some RF circuitry. But the important point was is that th what had been demonstrated before was that this transistor had high, really high bandwidth, 100 megahertz bandwidth, which is compatible with nanomechanical devices. So you had ultra-sensitive charge sensitivity and high bandwidth that could enable you to read out the motion of the mechanical devices and what Miles found when doing the, the calculations was that you could, in principle, approach the limit of resolving um, the displacement of the mechanical device with the sensitivity that was near the zero-point motion level for the mechanics, okay? And furthermore, he realized that you could use this detection technique for preparing squeeze states of, of the mechanical device, all right? So this was really I'm highlighting this because this was the first example of a proposal to use some sort of quantum device, solid state quantum device, for, as a quantum measurement tool for, for nanomechanics. Okay. And very quickly, um, in the following years after that, that was around 2000, in the following years after that, a no number of experimental groups, uh, including uh, the group I worked in, Keith Schwab's group at Maryland, got involved with trying to develop this displacement detector and see if, in fact, you could perform a measurements of motion with sensitivity that was approaching the zero point level. Um, and, I'll talk about these efforts in more detail in, in lecture two, okay? Okay, the punchline is, is though that yes, you can get very close to the zero point uh, limit with these, with these uh, displacement detectors. Okay, so do, should I go to nine, 9.45 or 9, nine is that okay? Or, okay, um, I wanna just highlight one other solid state quantum device that was um, developed in the late 1990s that was important for uh, the development of quantum electromechanical systems. And that's um, a superconducting, uh, a set of devices would be superconducting uh, quantum bits. And so, you know, in the, in the late 1990s and 1999, there was a seminal result uh, from a group at NEC in Japan, uh, the experiments were led by Nakamura, in which they demonstrated that this little box, this little superconducting island here, could behave as a bona fide two-level quantum system. They were able to prepare it in superposition states and show Rabi oscillations between the two, the two states. Future experiments show that you could do Ramsey interference experiments with it and all, all kinds of other stuff. And of course, this is ushered in, this ushered in a, an era of, of development in superconducting qubit technology, which continues to this day. And actually, these qubits serve as sort of the, the backbone of this the superconducting quantum computing effort that, that's ongoing now. And I'll talk a little bit about sort of the state of the art of that in lecture three. But what was important is when this, uh, this superconducting charge qubit, also known as a Cooper pair box, or CPB, was first developed in 1999, it was quickly realized by uh, people in the field of mechanics that you could also use this for, for coupling to mechanical devices and use this as a tool for quantum state engineering and measurement, okay? And so the, the initial proposals of, of integrating a, a superconducting qubit with a nanomechanical device go back to around 2002. Uh, and again, Keith Schwab, along with his colleagues, theory colleagues, Andrew Armour and Miles Blanco, what they realized was that you could take one of these superconducting charge qubits, integrate it on wafer with a nanoelectromechanical device using basically the same fabrication techniques for the two, two types of systems. And then you could establish a really simple electrostatic interaction between the two. And at the end of the day, and, and you can establish that interaction by just applying a voltage, basically, between the nanomechanical resonator and this little box here. And at the end of the day, this system just boils down to uh, essentially being analogous to an you know, artificial two-level atom coupled to some kind of um, you know, electromagnetic resonator. Okay? It's analogous to systems in, in cavity QED. And you know, in the, their initial proposals here, they imagined you know, we know, they knew from Nakamura's work that you could prepare this Cooper pair box in some kind of superposition state. So you can imagine doing that, preparing the qubit in a superposition state, turning on the interaction with the mechanics, and then allowing that, you know, enabling, allowing the system to evolve where you have some kind of superposition state of the mechanical devices. And in this paper, they showed that, in fact, or they calculated, in fact, that this superposition state should live long enough for, for us to measure it uh, using the right readout technology. And again, I'll get into more of the state of the art of how, you know, how close people are to getting to that kind of measurement uh, in, in lecture three. What was important, though, is that this, in, these initial proposals, they really motivated a myriad or a flurry of other uh, groups to start proposing ideas 
that mapped onto this system many of the beautiful techniques and experiments and understandings from cavity QED, quantum optics, atomic physics onto this system, but here to use it, use these ideas to sp explore the quantum properties of the mechanical devices. Okay, and just I want to just give you a, a short list of the different kinds of proposals that were put forth throughout the two th early 2000s. It ranged from everything from using these Cooper pair boxes to uh, produce nanomechanical superposition states. There's a bunch of proposals there. Um, there were proposals to use the qubit uh, to do things like perform measurements of the energy spectrum of the nanomechanical device to, to use the qubit for quantum non-demolition measurements of the energy of mechanics. There were a series of proposals for using uh, different types of qubits for cooling the mechanical mode, squeezing it, lasing it, et cetera. And then there are also proposals for using this new qubit coupled mechanical device as a new element in, in quantum information processing. Okay, but a lot of these proposals here, they, they borrowed a lot of the understanding that had been developed in cavity QED and quantum optics and applied it to, to these, these proposals, uh, again, for ideas for you know, quantum state engineering of mechanical systems. And you know, as you go through these proposals, you see over and over again that this technology, it looks feasible. It looks feasible. We should be able to do this with these mechanical systems. Okay. You can see, so these proposals date back to 2002. And in the field, theory has always been way ahead of, of experiment. Uh, it wasn't until 2009 where we first demonstrated the, the very first interactions between one of these solid state qubits and a mechanical structure. That was work I was involved in as a postdoc at Caltech. And I'll talk again more about this in, in lecture three, but we demonstrated for the first time an interaction between one of these um, super excuse me, superconducting qubits and the flexural motion of a nanomechanical mode. We showed that the interaction was analogous to certain dispersive interactions in cavity QED. Uh, the following year, Andrew Cleland's group at, at University of California, Santa Barbara, they put forth a really spectacular result where they used a different kind of qubit, uh, known as a phase qubit, to interface with a mechanical device resonantly and showed that they could coherently swap a quantum of energy back and forth between this, this phase qubit and the nanomechanical mode. This provided basically the first demonstration of energy quantization in a micromechanical device. And uh, so it was a real milestone for the field. They were actually also able to prepare a superposition state of, of you know, zero and one phonon in the mechanical structure and uh, perform the first deco measurements of the decoherence time of a mechanical device in those measurements. So it's a really important result, and I'll describe that in more detail in lecture three. Um, and finally, there's been work in the last couple of years uh, with a group from Finland, Mika Salampa's group, They've demonstrated um, an effect that's complementary to the dispersive effect that we demonstrated in 2009. They showed that their mechanical resonator, which is this little like membrane right here, could stark shift their qubit. Basically, it gave rise to an AC nanomechanical stark shift of the qubit. Okay, so these these are these were some of the the, the first results of experimentally developing qubit coupled mechanics. Um, the important point to stress, though, is that this, we've only, experimentally, we've only begun to scratch the surface. I showed on the previous slides there was a long list of possibilities uh, with this system, and we've only begun, gotten started on them. So there's a lot more we, we can do with these systems. Okay. So, so far, let me recap what I've talked about in, this, in, in the lecture today. Um, I've talked about the roots of the field of mechanical quantum systems, going back to gravitational wave detection, nanoelectromechanical systems, uh, I've sort of lumped a bunch of different ideas together in this picture here with you know, the quantum electronic devices being integrated with nanomechanical devices and borrowing ideas from uh, cavity QED and quantum optics and atomic physics. So what's missing so far, what's left out, and I'll spend the last couple of minutes talking about that, uh, is the area that people refer to as optomechanics. Okay? And so in this, this collage here, you probably get the idea that uh, these are, there's a very diverse range of, of, of mechanical devices and, and uh, um, electromagnetic devices being integrated here. And really, so with the punchline, with the sort of underlying defining feature of optomechanical devices is, is it involves the integration of mechanical systems with high quality electromechanical cavities. And this um, plot here, it's from a Physics Today article, 2012, it's the review I highlighted earlier, it's a really nice picture here. On the x-axis, it's the mass of mechanical devices. 
And on the y-axis, it's the frequency of these different, different mechanical devices. All of these different devices are part of this field of, of optomechanics. And what's cool is that you know, it really highlights the diversity and the range of the different types of systems that are being explored. You know, on this far end over here, you really have truly macroscopic systems, things with masses of a kilogram and frequencies down at hertz or hundreds of hertz, uh, integrated with optical cavities. Um, as you start moving, though, downward, you get down to uh, you know, you have nanomechanical systems or micromechanical systems integrated with high quality electromechanical uh, resonators or cavities. And then you continue on further and you have another set of, of mechanical, nanomechanical systems integrated with different photonic uh, cavities, okay? And what's amazing with the, this, this graph is it really highlights the range in that you have essentially 21 orders of magnitude of range in the, in the masses of these systems. Everything from kilograms down to um, I guess it would be zep zepto, or atograms. Yeah, so 21 orders of magnitude range in, in mass, and about nine orders of magnitude range in frequencies, all falling under this general category of optomechanical systems. Okay, I'm going to talk a lot about the state of the art in optomechanics in lecture two. I just want to highlight uh, one important feature of these, these optomechanical systems. A, feed, uh, a phenomenon that's used for operating these systems, and that's um, radiation pressure. And I'm sure everybody here knows what that is, right? And so radiation pressure results from uh, photons imparting force upon objects when they scatter off of them. And of course, uh, everybody knows radiation pressure is important in astrophysical events, for, for example, shaping the, sh the structure of interstellar clouds, and it's important for considerations of uh, the dynamics of spacecraft. It's also, radiation pressure is important for uh, a modern technique of optical tweezers, right? So they use radiation pressure forces to do studies of configurational changes of biomolecules like DNA. But it's also important for optomechanics. And I'm just gonna give you a sense of why it's important today and we'll really get into more into the details of it next time. But it's important for optomechanics and you can see why. Uh, by just, we'll just go through this little cartoon here. Imagine you have some kind of optical cavity formed by a couple mirrors, uh, and you have one of those mirrors you, you have glued to, to a cantilever or a beam, something that, that can move. And of course, the, you know, this mirror is partially reflective, so you can shine laser light into the cavity here. And so, you know, obviously, as photons bounce around in this cavity, they're gonna exert forces, radiation forces on the two mirrors, right? And so the cantilever itself is also going to experience a radiation uh, pressure force. And what's important is that for the cantilever, the radiation pressure force it feels is actually going to be dependent upon its own position. So you can imagine detuning your laser so that you're below the cavity, uh, the, the cavity resonance. And as you, say, move this cantilever in closer and closer, and you make the separation between the mirrors closer and closer, you move the cavity resonance closer to the laser frequency, so the field builds up inside the cavity here, and it builds up until you hit the resonance condition. So the radiation pressure force will be building up likewise, right? As you, as you move the cavity frequency closer to the laser frequency, the radiation pressure force on the cantilever is gonna increase, okay? So that will also hold true if you fix the equilibrium position of the cantilever and then just let it oscillate. As this thing oscillates back and forth, it's changing the length of the cavity, changing the resonance of the cavity, which then changes the radiation pressure force on the mechanical structure. And this is really important because it, it actually, this effect can be used for both cooling and heating of the mechanical device. And it's actually a really effective technique. It's, this technique is called dynamical back action or sideband cooling and heating. And it's been employed now for cooling mechanical structures to their quantum ground state, okay? And again, I haven't explained how that, that works. I'll explain that in, in lecture two. But this radiation pressure, radiation pressure forces and their dependence on the position of mechanical devices can actually be used for cooling the mechanical structures to their quantum ground state, okay? So that's one important property of radiation pressure. We'll talk about the details next time. It's one important property for optomechanical systems. So another important uh, use for radiation pressure forces with uh, optomechanics um, comes from a number of proposals that have been put forth to use radiation pressure to engineer superposition states of macroscopic me uh, uh, mechanical devices. 
And this, I'm just going to show you one proposal that came out in the early 2000s from Penrose and Boomister and Marshall. Uh, the, the idea, the schematic is shown here. You have a Michelson interferometer, and in the two arms of the interferometer, at each end you have a, uh, a cavity. And in this cavity A here, you have one of the mirrors in the cavity is free to move because it's on some kind of cantilever. And the idea in the experiment is that you know, the, the equilibrium position of this, this little cantilever here will depend upon the radiation pressure in cavity A. So if you send in a single photon, and it has 50-50 you know, beam splitter here, a photon could go this way, a photon could go that way. It's in a superposition state of those two possible paths. Through the radiation pressure coupling, the oscillator will also be in a superposition of two different equilibrium positions, depending upon whether or not the photon is in this cavity or it's in that cavity. Okay? And, and so in this uh, theoretical proposal here, they outline a way that you could then read out the, the superposition state of this, this macroscopic mechanical mirror. And um, what's important for this, this, has, this experiment hasn't been done yet, but the field is working toward it. And you know, what's needed to do this, you need a mechanical oscillator at low temperature, low thermal occupation, you need a high Q oscillator, high finesse cavity, and you need to have radiation pressure forces. You need your mechanical devices to be sensitive to radiation pressure forces at the level of single photons. And the field of optomechanics is close, getting closer and closer to satisfying these conditions. So in principle, an experiment like that, where you're engineering a superposition state of this macroscopic mirror, uh, could be realizable in the near future. And I'll, again, I'll discuss the state of the art of optomechanics in, in the next lecture. OK. So let me conclude by saying um, you know, a lot of the systems, what I've shown you here today, falls under the category of sort of hybrid quantum systems, mechanical devices being integrated with, with all different kinds of other quantum systems, things like nuclear spins and single electron spins, mechanical devices being integrated with superconducting qubits. Uh, actually, I didn't show you this earlier, but this is a really cool result from last year where a super surface acoustic wave cavity was integrated with a quantum uh, bit, superconducting quantum bit. There's other work that I haven't talked about where mechanical devices are being integrated with uh, ultra-cold atomic systems like Bose-Einstein condensates. Um, and so, you know, it's like now that mechanical systems are entering this, this quantum regime, it's like we have a complete toolbox of different quantum components with, with which we can work, with, with which we can build stuff. You know, we have you know, quantum optical, quantum microwave, spin systems, solid state quantum systems. Now we have mechanical quantum systems entering that mix. And it's interesting to think about what technologies will ultimately evolve with all of these different quantum components. And honestly, I, I don't have a good picture of what the future holds in terms of different technologies. You know, some people uh, think that maybe fully quantum, uh, you know, fully coherent quantum machines are not too far off in the distance. Um, personally, I don't know what exactly a machine like this would entail, but I guess the, one of the points I want to make uh, throughout these lectures is with mechanical systems entering the quantum regime, it's really like we have a complete set of tools with which we could think about building uh, quantum machines like this. Okay. And that, that brings me to the end of the lecture. So thank you uh, for your attention, and um, we'll see you, see you next time. Are there any questions? Okay, it depends. Um, so that's actually some, been a focus of a lot of attention over recent years. So in, if you're talking about superconducting qubits, the state of the art right now in sort of, so let's say um, a, a T2 or T2 star, so dephasing time sort of averaged over multiple trials, would be, uh, it's approaching 100 microseconds. And, um, you know, you can have the relaxation times in some of the superconducting qubits are, are exceed a millisecond. Um, mechanical devices, it's, we're really, there's only a, less than a handful of examples of mechanical systems where they've actually performed, generated some kind of quantum state and measured a decoherence time. Uh, one of those systems, the decoherence time was uh, like 20 nanoseconds. The other system, it was uh, in the order of 12 or 20 microseconds, something like that. Yeah. Yeah, right. Yeah. 
No, it's not. Yeah. That, that was classical, and that was driven. They actually drive it to really high amplitude. But the ultimate limit in that technique would be if you could figure out how to operate the, the mechanical device at, you know, so or, you know, maybe really close to its ground state where you're limited by really low temperature or thermal fluctuations, your sensitivity. If you could have the right electronic transducers that allowed you to be limited by the thermal mechanical noise down near the, really the zero point level, then you would be able to detect for sure single, nu nuclei, single nuclei. Yep. How do you measure it? I, you, that's a great question. So um, <laughs> you can, you, we estimate it from, no, like, uh, I'm thinking of my group, but what we will do is estimate it from knowledge of the, the parameters, just the knowledge of the dimensions of the device. And so that, that gives you the geometric mass. And then you have to account for um, the effective mass, the definition of the effective mass can actually depend upon how your circuitry is integrated with the mechanics. And so if you're just detecting like the displacement of the midpoint of the mechanical device, your effective mass is, is different than if you were detecting the, like an average, you had a detector that detected an average displacement. Um, so there's, and you can, get, you can do those calculations to account for that. Um, Using the elasticity equations and knowing like the mode shape, um, I could give you, I can, I could show you some examples afterwards if you want on how to do that. But yeah. So in a nutshell, we estimate the ge the geometrical mass, and then depending upon the exact configuration of our circuit and our detection scheme, um, we have to integrate, perform a different integration over the the beam to estimate the effective contribution. Yeah, that's a good question. I, that's what um, I think. That's yeah, yeah. I I don't know. I mean, that's what that's what I think. Some people really be interesting to see. I mean, especially with like kilogram scale masses. I mean, then there are other theories that gravitationally induced wave function collapse and, and things like that that maybe you could explore at that at that level. Yeah, yeah. It's an, I, it's a great question. I, I don't have an answer to it. Yeah. I think that's what one of the motivations. Thank you.